All right. Uh, today is Wednesday, September 9th, and this is a Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group meeting. Uh, let me share with you guys my screen. Uh, this web client is so hard to use. <laughs> Yes. Can you guys see my screen by any chance? It's come yeah, we can see it now. Sounds great. Uh the couple of discussions happened in the past two weeks. Uh some of them I was a part of. Uh and uh we discussed the major thing we discussed is to cover the uh existing uh, where we represent uh, representative applications and how they conduct snapshot and uh, and the backup and uh, uh, we worked around some of those applications me particularly worked on Google there uh, the Kafka one and the uh, MySQL and the others uh, today the first item is to go through that uh, what do we have uh, one of the big purposes that we put all these use cases into our kind of white paper uh, and try to provide from our perspective, what do we think those, how those applications should be working? And that's one. And the other aspect is really to see whether the, uh, up, the container notifier, AKA uh, application execution hook can support those scenarios. So uh, that's the second item. She and I will go through what or uh, what are all the updates on the container notifier. I think we have made to a point more or less. We can we're ready for filing a cap. Uh, uh, the last things we are doing at this moment are to adjust the cap document slightly, and then once we have that done, I think she and our plan is to file the cap as soon as possible, right? And then uh, we will open the discussion to the group. Uh, any one of you, John, Tom, you want to get started? Uh, yeah. Wrong. Sure. Let me let me grab a document that we were working off of. Give me a moment. Sure. I'll stop sharing. I think we have a, a, a general doc where all the items are listed. Then we can go through one by one, right? Yeah, that's a good idea. I, I can have that doc open, so let me let me grab that one. I'll I'll put in the, the main doc as well. Thank you. So many docs at this point. Okay, so I'll, I'll show the main doc first. Uh, so here, uh, can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. Uh, great, so this is uh, the doc where we're talking about QS hooks. Um, I think the the approach, the high level approach that we wanted to take was to look at different applications and see what kind of hooks that they would require to take application consistent backups. Um, and so really our motivation here is to help drive the primitives we need in Kubernetes and, and specifically in this context, the container notifier API. Um, there are obviously many approaches to backup applications and so we decided not to make this an exhaustive list here. Right. I think there's other sections in the main uh, white paper that we'll add that will kind of go into that a little more detail. Um, there's also many applications that provide their own data protection. Um, it can be things that are outside of Kubernetes. You know, one example would be um, you know cloud data services like uh, like RDS, for example. Maybe they have their own backup mechanisms. We decided to not include that in this section specifically. And there's very application specific things. So um, an example here would be Kafka, which uh, Sean and I looked at there. Uh, the other thing we, we, I think, wanted to talk about was the scope of these hooks. So we wanted to figure out uh, you know, what, what kind of commands we'd actually be running in these hooks. 
you can imagine very, very general commands, you know, doing any, anything from uh, issuing arbitrary APIs to applications, or you can make them very specific. You know, you can have a very specific volume, freeze, unfreeze. You can make it very um, specific to an application, um, you know, like uh, flush tables with read lock, for example. We kind of went through, we'll go through this later, but we, we figure out what, what examples we wanted. Uh, we discussed the different mechanisms. Um, so this is kind of, you know, I think more what's well outlined in the container notifier uh, design doc that we, ha we have going. Um, so I'll skip over that section. Uh, we did discuss execution controls, um, but I think again, that will fall into the domain of the container notifier, right? If, if, we, if we figure out some applications will need specific controls around retries or timeouts or those kind of things. Um, you know, I think it'll have to be part of the container notifier API as well. Uh, so after that, we really just categorized the different types of, of databases. Um, and then we kind of went into specifics from there. Um, and so I think we, we had different sections. So, um, you know, we can start with Kafka because that's the one that Sean and I worked on. And then we can jump into the other ones, but just really quickly at a high level, we talk about relational databases, so things like MySQL and Postgres. Um, we talk about time series databases, so in FluxDB, Prometheus, that kind of thing. And I think Prashant will look at that one. Um, we also talked about um, key value stores like Redis. Uh, this one was assigned to me, but I didn't get to that. Uh, we talked about Kafka, so Sean and I like that one. Distributed databases like MongoDB, so that's in here. This is great, actually. I didn't realize everyone updated this, this document with, with the hooks. So Sean and I worked in a separate document, um, but we'll, we'll go into that. Um, so with that, let's go into the specific databases. Maybe each person can talk. I can present still if that's easier, but maybe each person who worked on each section can talk about what it takes to back them up. And we can talk about how that applies to the various um, hooks. So I guess, uh, Fung, do you want to talk about MySQL here? Uh, yeah, I can talk uh, briefly about uh, MySQL. <clears throat> so um, uh, basically, the, the the workflow is almost every every um, database would be similar in term that first you have to create the database operations in one way or another. Then you back up all the uh, persistent volume being used by that application. Um, in the approach that we are using, we just take a snapshot of the PVC, um, but some other um, application, they may use um, other way. Uh, and then we are un right? Those are the general steps for almost uh, all the database that we um, interact with. Um, then, but MySQL have a special thing is that um, we, if you connect it to a MySQL server and run the lock. And as soon as you disconnecting from that, uh, the lock will be automatically released. So you have to do a, a little bit trick there. So if you look into my uh, QS sec one, you're going to see that I propose a trick there. So that means that you, instead of running a QS command, you in a, a script. And that script, you run it, you push it into a background with a sleep so that it will keep the session running. So even when you, um, the container notifier command exit, the QS uh, script will be running in the background. And then you go on and the controller will go on and take a snapshot. And in the unQS, uh, which is another script to searching for the, uh, the script, the QS script and kill it. And that's, that is just uh, the general workflow on, for that one. And then after, you know, QS and QS, you go to a phase of cleanup. So with cleanup, uh, you also, because we are using um, container notifier in this case, right? So uh, for each of the QS and unQS, we issue a notification. Then in the cleanup, we have to delete these notification objects. Um, if in case of the, right, you cannot guarantee that everything will be success. So in case of the failure, you might have to do some actually additional cleanup. Like if you, let's just say you have three snapshot and only two of them success, you cannot go on and back up it, right? So you have to somehow go back and 
clean up the two that you already create so that it will not occupy the um, uh, take it over, take the rewrite source from the system. So that is with MySQL. Uh, I saw uh, many, uh, some people doing uh, the queries a little bit different. Uh, I, 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 um, I don't um, know exactly how they deal with the fact that MySQL will be disconnecting from that, uh, from the clients when it's exit from the command. So I have to look uh, further for that one. But this is at least what I have and I want to share. That's all. And I guess what's interesting here from a requirement perspective is that uh, you'll have to run the, the hooks in parallel with the snapshot, right? Essentially, the, we'll have to, the quiesce hook will need to be running the sleep command while the snapshot is being taken. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that is uh, how you can guarantee uh, app condition for MySQL. Uh, otherwise, you know, MySQL operation is still going on and so on and so forth. Uh, the the quiz is very simple. It's a flush all table with the read lock. So as soon as you uh, lock that, then you know customer user can continue reading. I think uh, from the um, the database as long, but but they were not able to write to it. So uh, which is safe for the app consistent from my point of view. Uh, Jean, does this work with the container notifier proposal? Um, having that kind of run in parallel. Yeah, I'm not sure. This is this one is a little weird, but I did do a prototyping with MySQL uh, for using the execute uh, the execution hook, the CRD approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. This one uh, we haven't really get to the coding part yet, but for the initial prototyping, we are going to do exact anyway. So, uh, so that's going to be sim similar. We are not going to start inside Kubelet when we are doing prototyping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess even with exec, you'll still it'll still be a little challenging though because you'll have to have mm -hmm. the exec running at the same time while while the other stuff happens, right? The snapshot is taken. Um, yeah, I do not uh, implement using uh, notifier contain notifier yet because obviously it's not available for us to use. But I'm using um, pot exec from Velero and it works. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I was using as well. I'm saying that for the prototyping for content notification that we will also be using exact approach actually. So it's going to be similar. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but if once we really switch to Kubelet, I'm not, actually not sure, uh, but because Kubelet internally, it's also doing an exact. Um, so yeah, I don't know if, uh, if there's any difference there. If, you know, if we do POC, it works with uh, controller approach, but doesn't work with that, that we have to see. Yeah, that's, I think we have to discuss it in the implementation detail, right? Well, this is just a proposed yeah. uh, general workflow. Right, uh, we, yeah. The exactly command might change when we run into the problem during implementation. Mm -hmm. But I Sorry. already tried it with the uh, pod execs for Valero pod execs, so it works there. and. Jing, I didn't understand the issue here. Look, it mm -hmm. seems as far as the steps, acquiescing, taking PVC snapshots and unquiescing, these are all done serially. Um, what's different is that the semantics of quiesce is different for MySQL in a sense that yeah. the application is not completely quiesce, it allows read access, but that's harmless as far as backup is concerned. So I think the workflow is quite actually general generic and can be applied to other applications. It's just that the semantics of quiet may be different for different applications. But as far as we are concerned, the fact that quiet taking PVC snaps on quiet are done serially, you're safe. There's no. Yeah, I think for, for the application, from the application point of view, I was just, I'm just not quite, I'm not that familiar with Kubelet. I'm just, since uh, eventually we want to do this one in Kubelet, I'm not sure if there's any anything extra there. That's what I'm trying to say, since I haven't really uh, coding directly inside Kubelet. And then the POC we're going to do, even with the container notification, is going to be in a separate controller to start with. Uh, so uh, we'll have to check with the signal. They probably you know, would uh, understand more from this uh, point of view. Yeah, I, I think what I'd Alana was, uh, was talking about is those steps happen in different components, and those are just the sequences. 
who executes word is it, it, not purely Kubernetes part of responsibility. Yeah, that part that part is not changed, right? Yeah, that part is yeah, still. I the think same. he's right. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he's right about that, and, and uh, it really depends on upper level uh, controller to guarantee the sequence of it, the ordering of it. Because in normally you would have the external controller will have to uh, check the status of the notification. So uh, in this case, I'm not sure if Q, uh, or what or Kubelet or this other controller will be able to update the status yet. So that's I think that's the that's the only thing. So you might oh, I, I, yeah. Well, I was doing prototyping. This was some time ago with the, the execution hook. Uh, mm -hmm. I basically just. Did, uh, do it immediately, right? So because you, if you are keep running that, then you wouldn't know. Then, then let's say Kubelet or some some or execution controller, execution hook controller, it's not going to update the notification status. And then, so for this external controller, what, how is it going to know that it's the, ready? The execution controller. The external controller needs to watch the uh, container not, not container notification right? notification status. But then in this case, if it keeps running, it's not going to return status. I think that's the that's the uh, problem here with this particular. I, I think let, let's not just uh, get stuck on this first one. I think that MySQL is very special. We can come back and talk about this. Uh, can we maybe move on to this other uh, databases? We can come back. I think MySQL is really special. I, I agree that I agree that MySQL is very special. <laughs> Among the database that we deal with, uh, MySQL is the most complicated. <laughs> yeah, because you're basically when you're doing your thing, it's it's not coming back, right? So if it's not coming back, then you wouldn't have a, then Kubelet won't be able to set change the status of the, the notification object, which mm -hmm. the same can, controller is really with. Um, the detail offline to uh, and um, to show the uh, exact status, uh, how you know that is the QS successful. It, 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 we can do that. It's just that um, I do not show all the detail here. Okay. Yeah, we can probably, this one we can probably, you know, uh, dig more offline. Yeah. yeah, we don't have to get stuck on this one, one case. Yeah, that sounds good. And even if you close your session, you still, you can still take a best effort snapshot afterwards, which uh, we'll at least have all the data up to the date when you ran the flush tables, right? Which I think is what happens with. Uh, right, but then in that case, you wouldn't. It would be I a mean, crash consistent backup in that case. Yeah, no, no, crash consistent, system. yeah. Right. Yeah, in that case, we mean to mark, mark the backup as inconsistent or something so that the user know. That's true. Uh, Prashant, do you want to talk about the time series databases? Sure. Uh, can anyone hear me well? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So what I did was I researched uh, three different time series databases, NoDB, Prometheus, and uh, InfluxDB. And uh, at a high level, what I realized or what I felt was these databases are relatively newer to you know, MySQL, Postgres, and other relational or object storage distributed databases that have been around for a while. And uh, these databases are so mature that they are providing you know, backup and uh, restore utilities, which are not only just QSing the application, but actually creating the backup object for the user as well. Right. Um, so as a result of that, uh, you know, the data protection, uh, the data protection challenge is greatly simplified uh, from a, a vendor perspective. It's as easy as running those commands for taking a backup and, you know, doing a restore and pointing the database to that restored archive or wherever you are restoring the contents. It's as simple as that. Uh, so we can go in order. Uh, what I've done here is uh, kind of looked at each of these databases uh, differently. I've kind of looked at, uh, you know, chalked out each database in these four segments. Uh, you know, talking about the overview, uh, you know, what is the backup strategy to use? What is the resource strategy to use? And the set of commands that will give you the full backup, you know, full restore, incremental backup, incremental restore, and, you know, any kind of transactional log copying or journal copying of that nature. So speaking of uh, NoDB, uh, 
this one uh, has all the bells and whistles, you know, to do, you know, offline backup if you want to shut down your database and take a backup, or if you want to do it uh, online while the database is running. It supports, uh, you know, doing a full backup of the entire database, incremental backup of the database, and also copying of the transactional logs. So all are just single line, uh, you know, CLI options that you can run against the database and it creates all that for you. From a strategy perspective, all that needs to be done is you need to create a backup set against the application. Um, you should be doing obviously low frequency full backups, high frequency incremental backups, and then highest frequency journal copies to get the point in time recovery based on your logs. A question. The incremental backup number three, is that uh, under online, offline, or both? Uh, everything is on, so whatever I've uh, documented here is all uh, online. I've just said that, the, right, okay. that that is offline, but you know, we don't really want to shut down your storage managers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the more interesting piece is the online backup, which I'm focusing on. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so all the full backups, incremental backups and the journal copies are online activities. Uh, what happens is there is a directory that is created where all these items get uh, placed and uh, you know depending upon the command that you use whether it's a command for a full incremental or journal and then similarly when you restore it you just have to point to that backup set where these items are placed or point to an individual full backup or an incremental backup and the target cluster or you know the restored application would uh, restore it and start using that data for its activities or for its configuration moving forward. So very straightforward, uh, didn't find any you know, challenges in terms of uh, you know, what is required, the documentation, you know, uh, the documentation is pretty large, but I've kind of summarized it in terms of this is how a you know, a successful backup and restore should happen. Um, Prashanto, how do you map this to, to Kubernetes? So if we, the primitives we have right now are essentially volume snapshots and then we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about adding the QS hooks. So I think the difference that I see is, you know, with uh, traditional databases, we would QS it and then we would take a snapshot. Uh, you know, uh, here I would say that we would probably just depend upon the application to you know do the QS and to create the copy of the backup. We would you know take a snapshot of the persistent volume still, and then you know the hooks or whatever the injection commands are. There needs to be a workflow where the user can specify and provide this uh, background, or you know upon restore can specify these commands and the things that he need to needs to do to massage the content afterwards. But from our like from our data protection vendor perspective, it should just be a simple copy of the application along with the persistent volumes. The data is captured in the persistent volume, and when you're restoring it, you uh, you know hook into that uh, backup object again. Uh, I have a question. It look, mm -hmm. looks like all of this backing up and uh, restoration is file level operations, right? Just copying file from Correct. some folder into another one. But in our case, we will be doing PV PVCs and one snapshot API. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is how, how does that fit into the picture? So I think uh, if we are, it's because it is happening at the file level, there is, uh, you know, definitely, you know, there are these uh, pointers and everything which they are using to just create that snapshot object. And from an API perspective, if I understand the uh, cor uh, the question correctly, I don't think there should be any difference because as long as we are capturing the PV, you know, using any kind of uh, snapshotting technology via CSI or something, we should be able to capture all the file level items without any issues. But what are the sequence then? Who is creating those uh, API objects? I the, don't what. The API, uh, you mean the API objects? Like the PVC, yeah, like the PVC, PV objects. Who are creating those and at what time? When does that happen? I mean, in this so, sequence, I'm not clear to me. So basically what is happening is, uh, you know, when we are taking the full backup, full restores, uh, you know, it is creating the backup object and putting it on the persistent volume itself that was used by the database, right? So as long as you take that persistent volume and you map it to another instance of the database and you know make that instance point to the backup object after restoring it, uh, it should be good enough to come up. Um, 
Uh, Prashant, then, so that PVC needs to have double the size of the existing database to accommodate the copy? No, I wouldn't say it's double because, you know, it, because it's a file level thing, it must be using pointers and it, uh, you know, it doesn't, def uh, it doesn't increase the capacity you know, doubly or something like that. It does use space efficient uh, mechanisms underneath the covers. So th while there is some amount of data that will be created, it's not going to double it uh, right off the bat. Oh, okay, so it, it, it looks to me it's a, a dump, right? A MySQL dump into the same PVPVC. Mm -hmm. And then we take a snapshot in the back, uh, of that PVPVC. And then why do we even need the restore then? Why, why can't the original file structure already support the case? So when you are doing a restore, uh, you are still, I mean, there is a restore command that needs to work on the backup object to restore the contents into a format that the newer or the target database can understand. So you still need to perform that restore operation and then the, you know, connect that database to that restored object and then everything will be functioning again. Uh, sure, but if both the real data and the dump sit mm -hmm. on the same PV, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Then the application can simply just use the real data. Yes, so that, that's why you need to map it. Uh, the real data is not the consistent data, right? The consistent data is the backup object that you created. So while both of them are on the same PV, you will want to change, like, you know, you can delete the original data if you need to and just map to the, uh, you know, the backed up data and do it that way. But you technically do not need the original data after you do the restore. Okay. Right, and the we Prometheus uh, example that I have next is exactly that, uh, you know, where the, uh, where a snapshot, you know, the steps and everything, you know, pretty much the same. There is a snapshot copy uh, or snapshot command that you run, which creates that snapshot on the same PV where the Prometheus data uh, database is pulling all its uh, information from. Now, when you're restoring it, all you need to do is uh, map that part, storage dot, uh, time series database path to that snapshot that you had just collected. So it's as uh, it seems, I mean, it's very straightforward because, you know, all the QS inconsistency, everything is taken care of by the application that is putting it into the same PV that you were already using. And from a backup restore perspective, it's uh, about mapping it to the right consistent object upon restore. Okay, uh, where are the QSing hooks executed? Uh, when you say where are the QSing hooks from the application's perspective or from the, uh, you know, from our perspective, from Kubernetes? From our perspective. From Kubernetes, there, are, there is no specific hooks, I would say, that are technically required here other than the fact that, there should, oh, sorry, there is no QSing piece of a hook required here, other than the fact that you should be able to hook into the CLI libraries or the command API libraries that these applications provide. Uh, but okay. what is the equivalent of like the like log table? Is there some command that is required to quiesce? Oh, no, as long as you run, like, for example, if you see the full backup command about, about mm -hmm. for no CMD hot copy database, uh, this will QS, this will do everything underneath. Everything, it's space. just one everything. command. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, I mean, as I went through these, you know, that was my understanding. Uh, you know, it seems like these newer databases have seen the challenges, the problems that have been faced you know, with all the other databases that we've been dealing with so far. And they've just provided, you know, very simple, straightforward ways to do these things. And the newer DB, uh, you know, the full backup, incremental backup, journal copy, resembles a lot of uh, a Microsoft SQL Server in terms of how they provide their backup capabilities as well. You know, journal copy is basically the transactional logs and they provide the same kind of full incremental transaction log copy to manage your overall strategy around it. When you say incremental, do you know how they manage the history? Uh, not really. I can do some more digging around it, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure. 
uh, I would assume it's, you know, just uh, CBT kind of stuff and they may have their own uh, handlers to figure out what the change blocks were. Uh, but I can dig into it more to see what they are doing internally. I see. And, and when you run the command, I assume the temp hot copy, the date needs to be an input. Yes, yes. So uh, what I'll do is I'll update the CLI command reference as well. But uh, yeah, you need to provide the, uh, are you talking about the uh, backup or are you talking about the restore? Both. Yeah, so te technically when you're doing the backup, you need to uh, point to the backup set where it's going to be stored and obviously the database name. And then when you're restoring it, you're uh, pointing to the backup object and the restore location where you want to restore it. Okay, so when you take uh, uh, when you whenever you run this command, you will create we will, the the database we will create uh, an incremental or full backup, right? Then actually the size might be much bigger than the database itself because you might end up running this command multiple times, no? Correct. Yes, yes. So those are things that we definitely need to keep track of. And uh, the other thing that I did not add over here is, you know. Uh, Nuo DB and Influx DB also provide policies. Okay, so they have their own policy schedules that can manage these incremental backups, delete the oldest one, uh, you know, when the latest one is taken, and those other things. So the user could you know, leverage those items, you know, if he's just managing a single application directly, or if he's managing multiple applications which have the same kind of uh, strategies, then you would need like a single solution that can do all these together. Sure. Well, one last dumb question. Yeah, please. How, how do we, how, how does the external, the, the upper level controller, the application snapshot controller, know the uh, destination directory or source mm -hmm. directory, the backup and restore? The map being able to map map that directory to a certain PVPVC. So right now, as I said, uh, the backup directory is the directory or a folder structure on the persistent volume itself. But you can configure additional controllers to map it to an external S3 repository or something as well. Um, so, so I, I I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly. Uh, no, no, no. The the uh, those databases, right? How many PVPVCs they have? Um, I mean, they could have multiple, right? For example, exactly. Uh, yeah. Then how does we know? How do we know which PVPVC to take a snapshot to capture the dump? Um, I'm assuming that it would be um, it would be placing it on some master controller object where you know everything is stored together. Um, I can dig in that for you and figure out. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I did not look into it myself. Yeah, I think I the number of PVCs and PVs don't matter here because the artifact of the backup operation is a file. So if the database spreads around, mm -hmm. spread across multiple PVs, it shouldn't matter because the artifact is a single file. That's a but good point. That's a good point. And I think for influx DB, if we scroll, uh, scroll a bit up or down, and I think that's exactly what uh, they're also doing. They basically create these three objects. You know, they, you, you can have multiple shards, but it just creates a single shard object for as part of the backup item that it creates. So, so is this similar to say, rather than snapshotting MySQL, this would be doing a MySQL dump, and then you, you've got to dispose of the file? Is that the analogy here? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I looked into, there is no single way of just QSing the data and then taking snapshots of the PVs. Uh, you know, this uh, ability to do snapshotting plus dump by the application was the only method that I saw across these uh, three databases. Yeah, I think these are more akin to snapshots than to backups because we still have to rely on PV backups so that the artifacts are stored elsewhere. Yeah, they do allow you to, purposes. yeah, they do allow you to store the artifacts elsewhere as well. Uh, but the only way you can do it here is that you can have a different PV attached and your backup files end up in the other PV. 
and that yeah. way it's like a remote Correct. place. Correct. But that's a little. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's more about, you know, if, yeah. if you're not using a centralized data protection solution and if you're just using the application, uh, you know, pieces to protect it, then that would definitely make sense. But I think the question or the strategy for, from a data protection solution perspective should be uh, having the ability to run these API commands, uh, I believe, you know, before we take a backup, uh, you, you, know, you do your own kind of backup of the persistent volume and before you restore you are providing some capability to massage the content before the actual restore right. happens. yeah i would imagine basically the backup commands like if you scroll up a little bit like those are run as part of the quiescing the application exactly and we also exactly. need to have we need some capability to run custom commands during restore yes yes and especially with what well, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is you know once we we are moving these applications uh, from one side to another side, and we are QSing it. You know, the application is still in a QS state when we are going to be restoring it. So upon the restore, also there needs to be a unQS uh, command that might need to be executed. You know, normally if we think about legacy days before Kubernetes, we would take the data volumes and we would move that across multiple instances. So we never really had to do that unQS again, you know, on the application side. But here, if you're not just moving the data volume for the entire application as well, that unQS would become something that you would want to run against the app before resuming operations. Yeah, this is very similar to SCD snapshot. And for exactly. SCD snapshot, exactly. there is no quiescing or unquiescing SCD. It's just restarting SCD with a new data volume. So I would imagine exactly. so some I think, applications uh, would be like that, like there's no unquiescing or quiescing. Definitely. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. got to look at it at two levels, right? The applications where like, you know, these time series at CD that provide everything built in versus, you know, uh, databases like MySQL and so on, which just provided up to the QS import. I think that's how the high level, you know, workflows would be differentiated in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So these uh, incremental backup files or, you know, journal copy files that you generate as part of running these commands, are they self-contained or you need a previous history to be able to you consume them, like restore them? Um, so everything follows the concept of a backup set. So if you're running an incremental backup and you're pointing to that uh, slash temp slash hot copy directory and that hot copy directory was a backup set, then it will use the data within that directory to you know, do the change block tracking and figure out what the incremental pieces are that need to go into that particular directory. You can have multiple directories for the same kind of backup as well. So it just follows the hierarchy structure of a backup set and everything gets put into that backup set. Okay, so what you're saying is that like inside the slash temp hot copy directory, that's where all the incremental backups are stored mm -hmm. and the new CMD is smart enough to know when the last backup was generated and it just generates the diff from that point on. Yeah, and it, it also tags subdirectories as full incremental journal and puts those copies in it. And also, you know, there'll be full hyphen one, full hyphen two, full hyphen three. So there is, I believe it's following that kind of hierarchy and the naming convention to map which, you know, which incremental backup is the next in sequence and stuff. I see. Yeah, overall, I mean, I would say that uh, definitely simplifies life from a you know recovery migration perspective and so on like uh, if we if just another point i'll add on in flux db they also have the capability of doing continuous disaster recovery so you could have two in flux db instances and you can just start keep importing data from one instance into the other instance and provide a time interval and look at yeah that, that's very typical in you know for those applications uh, anyway, th thanks. Uh, this is a lot of information we need to consume, uh, but we still got a couple more to uh, cover. Mm -hmm. Can we, uh, if you don't mind, we're going to just move to another one. Yep, sure. Anthony, do you want to quickly go through Mongo? Yeah, I can I can go through it quickly. Uh, yeah, so I spent the time to look at Mongo, MongoDB. Um, and for MongoDB, uh, as opposed to MySQL, where you have to keep that session running and running the, the quiet command. Uh, MongoDB provides the, uh, a, a similar command to run the quiet and unquiet, but for this one, um, you don't have to keep the session running. So 
once you run the choirs command, this is the DB fsync lock. Uh, so MongoDB will return like a JSON um, document that contains the, uh, the response status. So this will be, um, you know, the status of the, the command. And also it keeps track of the lock count uh, so that for every lock that you run, um, MongoDB will keep the lock count and it will, it will keep incrementing that uh, for every um, choirs, uh, for every uh, DB fsync lock command that you run. Um, so there should be a corresponding unlock command that will decrement that lock count. Uh, and for the, uh, for the database to be unlocked, that lock count has to be zero. Um, so, uh, you know, comparing MongoDB to MySQL, it's uh, the, running the quiet and quiet, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the only um, one of the, so I looked at the, uh, the, the sharded MongoDB. Um, this one, there's one extra step that uh, users to run, and this is to disable the cluster, load bal uh, the cluster balancer. <laughs> um, so for sharded cluster, you have the data is, um, distributed um, among the, shard, the shards. Um, and before you take the backup, you first have to stop the balancer uh, uh, because if, um, if there's any data migration that's happening between the shards uh, during the backup, then you, can, you might end up with an inconsistent backup. Uh, so it's very important to stop the balancer before the backup. Um, and that's, and so on I just, each, uh, that's on each replica, right? Right, right. <clears throat> yeah, so it's interesting here for the, for the con from the perspective of the container notifier is that you have to do some a little bit of coordination between what happens on each replica. It seems like for shard and Mongo, you have to execute commands on each, each replica first, and then you can do the f-sync and then the, the snapshot. Right. Actually, it seems you just need to connect to, from the documentation, you just connect to any of the, the, the Mongos and you can run the, the stop balancer command. Mm. And then, so this will stop the cluster balancer. And MongoDB also provides two functions that you can use to query the status of the, the balancer. This is the, you can, you can use the get balancer state and there's another one, the is balancer running. So this one will enable you to, to, to verify the status of the balancer. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you verify that the balancer is disabled, um, you need to back up the config database. I think this is where the MongoDB um, stores the metadata for the sharded cluster. Um, and then, so it depends now, there are some options where if you choose uh, pre precision, you, you will need to um, run the quires command. So lock all the, uh, you know, all basically lock the entire cluster. You, you, you need to run the, the DB fsync lock command uh, on all the, I believe for each replica set. Uh, this is prior to doing the PVC snapshot. So you lock basically the entire cluster. Uh, alternatively, you can just run the uh, the lock command on the second member of each shard a replica set. Uh, this is in case you don't want, you know, you don't want to have uh, your all the whole cluster locked. Uh, Anthony, are, are those API calls or uh, those, is there any like shell script or whatever with the uh, can be hooked into the execution hook? Right, so this will be run on the shell. Uh, so for example, with the pod exec, um, it will gotcha. run on the, shell, on, on the shell of the, you know, the MongoDB container. Well, there's okay. through the In Mongo each. Uh, protocol so you can execute it through the mongo shell or you can you can connect to the cluster remotely right right yeah i tested this with i've done this with uh, <clears throat> using the valero like like fong mentioned the valero <clears throat> exec uh, so this one um, i was about to get it running uh, with the pod exec but yes if you shell if you open a shell to one of the containers then you can you can run this same command and all the shards, is it like a one-to-one -one mapping between a shard and a PV? Right. So from the deployments I tried, I, I yeah, I saw there's just one PVC uh, per shard. So each shard is a, it's a stateful set, uh, and you can have, you'll have like the primary member and any number of uh, secondaries for each shard. Mm -hmm. Right. And the uh, 
the snapshotting and everything can happen like in parallel for each of those PVCs, right? Right. So I think on step, uh, so once you acquire the, uh, you know, depending if, if it requires the whole application or each secondary member, then uh, the PVCs need to be snapshotted in parallel. I think just to make sure that, uh, you know, they are uh, consistent. Mm -hmm. But if they are all quiet, they don't have to, right? I mean, there is no guarantee that they are snapshotted at exactly the same time. Right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I have one question. When you do a uh, sync log, right, F sync log, so that means all write operation will stop. Right, yeah. So, the so what will happen to the write operation if uh, during the backup period, the, if anybody is right, trying to write, what will happen to those write? Um, so I think the right is um, it will be queued or uh... yeah it will be queued um, yeah it will, it will be queued and then once you unlock that's when now the right will be committed okay so that uh, means it's kind of a outage for application right if they're using the application actively yeah yeah so in general uh, in general uh, MongoDB also su uh, suggests to take backup using ops manager they have a one tool right uh, and it takes the backup on S3 or any other de devices. And you can restore point in time recovery. I, I'm not sure uh, by taking snapshot, can we restore point in time recovery? We cannot because we're, we're, we're essentially just copying the volume data. Yeah. Ops manager uses, uh, is like a logical level dump. And then it, it uses the ops log to do point in time, I think, okay. which is like just the Mongo journal basically. I, I, from my experience, uh, the logical dumps from Mongo are very slow. Um, for any reasonably sized database, we, you know, uh, we only we've only been able to use volume snapshots. But that's you know that's my anecdotal experience. Yeah, that's that's very typical to conduct dump. Even my SQL dump is it's pretty slow compared to taking a snapshot of a PVC. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but if you use Ops Manager, right, they have the backup uh, BRS, they call backup recovery service. They do a snapshot, take the snapshot mm. and uh, every 15 minute, one hour, and then they took the op log is there. Op log, it takes the uh, incremental changes. So you can restore to any point in time recovery. It creates a target. Sure, yeah. sure but that's how I connect to a specific application. That's That's actually what I meant. Some of the applications might have it, some application might not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I have a question. Sorry. Sorry. Question on point five. So, here you're, you're saying for approximate point in time snapshots, you can minimize the impact by taking the backup from a secondary member. So, if you want to have a exact point in time snapshots, basically we have to rely on Mongo APIs and that will take it from the primaries. But you're saying if we don't care about the exact point in time and we want to do approximate, then we can take it from secondary. but you know, they may be lagging behind and um, and then, so that's one question. And the second question is like for that scenario, like does Mongo expose APIs to know which nodes are primary, which nodes are secondary? Like can we have a scenario where one node is primary for some shards but secondary for some other shards? Oh. Yeah, I could check this. So um, yeah, MongoDB, it provides, there's, an, there's a call, I think DB is master, which would return true if that specific instance is the, is the, the primary, sorry. Um, and so you can use that call to check if that instance is uh, the primary node. Um, and then for this one, for the approximate point in time, uh, this is from, uh, actually I, I, I linked down there the, the documentation for for uh, the, from the manual for how MongoDB recommends taking a backup of the sharded cluster. So this is how they recommend if, depending on your position, if you want to have a, a point, exact point in time, then stop all application rights. But just for point in time snapshot, you, you can do it from the secondary member of the replica shard. Um, okay, thank you. But so basically, it's easy to understand, to figure out which nodes are primaries, which nodes are secondary. And we can have a situation where one node is primary for some shards and secondary for some other shards, right? 
Um, um, it's okay if you don't know the answer. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I can look into it. And also, you know, one thing, the MongoDB documentation, it's, I found it to be very comprehensive. Uh, so I tried to okay. link some of them uh, down there. Um, I can also look, look into it after the meeting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Shin, we only got five minutes left. <laughs> uh, we won't be able to go through the uh, execution hooks, but this is all good okay. discussions. Uh, yeah. We still got Kafka. Uh, uh, we will oh, make okay. it a short Tom. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Sean, you do most of the heavy lifting here, but I can give a quick summary. Uh, so Kafka is interesting because it's pretty tough to actually do data production for Kafka. Uh, Kafka has multiple uh, broker nodes, each which has is primary for some subset of uh, the topics, which is kind of similar to the shards in, in uh, manga we were just talking about. Um, backing it up is, is really a challenge because you really have to take down the brokers. Um, there's not kind of a simple QS hook that you can, you can execute really. It's kind of a stop the service itself. The other thing is uh, there's kind of two imagined data services you need for this. One is kind of the thing that serves the actual topics and messages. And the other one is, is Zookeeper. So Zookeeper contains two kind of important bits of information. One bit is the consumer offsets. So if I have a client, I actually do have some server side state that tracks kind of where I am. It also contains topology information for who is, um, who's currently the leader for, uh, for the various, um, among the brokers for various topics. Um, so we did kind of mock up what backups of this would look like in Kubernetes. It's pretty, I would say it's definitely best effort. You know, this, this would be possible to execute, but it wouldn't involve some downtime, right? In fact, when you freeze and un unfreeze the Zookeeper volumes, uh, you would not be able to make progress in your, your uh, client side offsets, your, excuse me, your consumer offsets stored in Zookeeper, um, which is problematic, right? That, that doesn't go with, one of the goals here was to have as little downtime as possible. Um, and then you could just take the normal volume snapshots, right, uh, on a per broker basis. Uh, I think our recommendation for this is basically that, you know, this is similar to what we looked at with Nuo, where maybe it's not a great fit for this this type of um, quies unquies hook. Um, you know, you might need some kind of application uh, integration to to get this this correct. Um, is there anything else, Sean? You want to mention? Yeah, I also want to bring the topic to the community. Uh, it is interesting that Kafka is one of the great examples where there are actually multiple applications within this offering. So Kafka itself depends on Zookeeper. If you treat Zookeeper, Zookeeper itself is an application, right? Uh, the What makes things complex is the Zookeeper itself can serve Kafka, but it also can serve others. So uh, we put this thing together again with the best effort because at least based on our very limited research, Tom and I haven't found an effective way of doing this in Kubernetes environment. And that's one. The other one, which is also interesting is that as previously mentioned applications, they are already pretty rich tools around those applications to do either uh, in-place backup or a snapshot within the environment or asynchronously copy the data to another cluster. That's actually most of the data, uh, most of the end users achieve DR uh, in these days. For example, Mirror Maker 2 is a very kind of, you know, popular tool that is widely used in the Kafka community uh, to asynchronize, replicate, make the asynchronize replication. Uh, you get some drawback from that. Uh, and more interesting, more interestingly, I think for almost all these distributed uh, systems, they all for very high availability guarantees, right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, for, uh, Kafka can even do a, a stretch cluster Kafka, which means that your, your Kafka can run in two different data centers. Even if you lost one data center, you still have the, the other one up and running without affecting your business. So it, it, in this case, with all these complications fitting in here, 
I'm not sure we are ready to propose anything in this community for this very complex applications per se. Uh, one thing I, I think I took away from today's session is that uh, maybe it's not a very bad idea to look into those typical applications supporting tools to take backup. In this case, if those tools already supporting uh, application consistency snapshot or backup functionality, us as a community maybe can just wrap or control on top of it and utilize those functions directly without you know, even in working webhook to do the quiet. And webhook becomes a me mechanism to issue a signal. And that actually goes well for the concept of a container notifier. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I have today. I, I think uh, I, I will sync up with Shin later on. I, I think I really appreciate all the effort everyone put into this. It's a lot of effort in a very short period of time. Uh, Shin, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through the uh, our agenda today. Uh, I yeah, guess we need to okay. postpone this to another. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Yeah, I think it's a lot of material to cover today. Thanks, everyone. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah. Yeah, and Alice uh, volunteered himself to cover the uh, XCD operator from OpenShift. Uh, maybe we, we can sync offline on that as well. Uh, thanks everyone for today's meeting. Uh, any last minute questions or suggestions? I think we'll have to figure out, uh, we still want to follow up and maybe have more meetings and figure out what's left here. Um, yeah. Maybe uh, Jing and Sean, maybe you can drive that. Yeah, I will. I will set up a follow-up meeting on to the on today's discussion. Uh, anyone, if you are interested in joining that follow-up meeting, we're going to mostly focus on what we discussed today in more detail. Please send me or Shin an email. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank have you, a Grace. nice week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.